Welcome back. This is Dr. Jin Sung, where clinical excellence meets excellent results. Today we're going to talk about a hormone called melatonin. What is it? What does it do? How much should we take? And what are the benefits of taking it? So let's get right into what melatonin is. Melatonin, does it help with sleep? Question mark. Melatonin is a hormone produced by the pineal gland and the enterochromatophen of the GI tract or the gastrointestinal tract. So it's not just a hormone that's produced by the pineal gland in the brain, it's also produced in the GI tract. And therefore it has many wide, uh, broad benefits uh, in our system. So one, it helps the circadian rhythm regulation. And we know that because we talk about melatonin in sleep. However, it also helps the, the release and timing of hormones for reproduction. So it's very important for a pregnancy and so forth. It also helps with mood, your immune system, it's an antioxidant, it's an anti-inflammatory, and it helps with pain. It's also very important for anxiety and the regulation of your body temperature. So when you take melatonin at night, it helps you get into your sleep cycle. However, it also reduces your core body temperature when you go to bed. So it's very important that it has a systemic effect when you take melatonin. So what, what do we use it for? We use it for headaches, migraines, neurodegenerative changes, primary and secondary sleep disorders, sleep promotion, especially for people who work second shift and third shift. Their circadian rhythm is off, so they may work three or four nights in a row, and then they have the weekend off, and their sleep cycle is altered. For, th for some of those pa uh, patients, it's very important that their melatonin uh, is used appropriately for them. Also for people who travel a lot, go to California and back, right? Go to Europe and back. And they do frequent travel for work. And it can be helpful for people who have jet lag, okay? In terms of neurodegeneration, as our brain ages, uh, because the pineal gland is in the brain, you can have some calcification within the pineal gland, uh, inhibiting the production of melatonin. So we have to kind of look at it uh, as uh, a neurodegenerative process uh, for people who can't sleep at some times. It can also help with hypertension and insulin resistance or basically blood sugar regulation. So uh, blood sugar regulation can also affect sleep, but melatonin affects blood sugar. So it's kind of this cycle of different things that can affect our sleep pattern. So I wanna get into some of the physiology of this because this is an important hormone that affects um, a lot of different things and it can be beneficial for a lot of different patients. Okay, so when you look at it, if you get sunlight, right? This is my rudimentary drawing of the eye. So if you get sunlight and hits the retina, it has a transmission, a nerve transmission through the optic nerve and it goes to a nucleus called the suprachiasmatic nucleus, right? The suprachiasmatic nucleus is the biological clock it sets our um, uh, wake cycle and sleep cycles. So light affects this as well as darkness. So for melatonin, when your eyes do not detect light, it will start to say, send a signal, right, to this nucleus. And that nucleus will send a signal to the PVN or paraventricular nucleus, all within the brain. And then that sends the signal to the superior cervical ganglion, which is in the upper cervical spine. And then that sends a signal to the pineal gland. So it's light affecting nerve, nerve transmission through different uh, areas of the brain to the pineal gland. And the pineal gland, once the signal is sent, it triggers your body to produce uh, melatonin. And the way it tr produces it is, it uses an essential amino acid called tryptophan. Tryptophan is converted to 5-HT, and then to serotonin, and serotonin is actually a precursor to melatonin. So people who are on antidepressants, uh, people who have good serotonin levels, it can all impact how melatonin will work 
because serotonin is the precursor, right? So you need an essential amino acid and that needs to be converted. Another good supplement in here would be uh, B6 or P5P. Uh, it would be a good one. And melatonin, when it's produced from the pineal gland, will have a feedback mechanism back to the suprachiasmatic nucleus. So this is a feedback mechanism, right? The sleep cycle is a feedback mechanism. So melatonin goes up, you fall asleep, and then it goes down, and then you wake. So when you look at melatonin and its relationship to cortisol, cortisol is very high in the morning, which wakes you up, it makes you feel hungry, and melatonin is very low. As the day goes on, cortisol will start to drop, and by, let's say, 9 or 10, melatonin will start to come up, and cortisol goes down, and melatonin will peak around maybe 2 or 3 in the morning. So it goes up, and it starts to put you to sleep and then it starts to wane down. So it has this inverse relationship between cortisol and melatonin. And that's why stress can impact sleep because cortisol levels are high and melatonin is suppressed at night and you can't fall asleep. So stress is an imp important factor. So this loop is very important to understand how light right, or darkness affects our sleep pattern. <clears throat> So what are some of the foods that we can use? Chocolate, milk, chickpeas, red meat, fish, poultry, cherries, walnuts, rice. So milk we know is one of those you know, remedies like when you can't sleep they warm up milk for you and in maybe an hour or two you start to fall asleep and this is the reason why. right? In terms of dosaging, when you have to dosage this you want to take it one to two hours before bedtime. So you want the melatonin to work. It's not a drug, right? It's not like where you take a drug and it has an immediate impact. It's a natural sleep cycle um, hormone. So you take it one to two hours before you actually want to go to bed, and then it'll have a slow rise um, in how it's going to work. So some of the studies have used 2.5 to 10 milligrams uh, in different types of studies for sleep and other physiological effects, right? However, I recommend a dosage of like 0.1 to 3 milligrams, right? 0.1 to 0.3 milligrams, I'm sorry, right? Very, very low dosage. Why? Because your body really doesn't need a lot of melatonin to make you fall asleep. So rather than use higher doses, you use lower doses to see what kind of physiological effect you can have. And um, then you can ramp up the dosage over time, right? The bioavailability is about 15%. So it's somewhat absorbable, and it's also fat-soluble and water-soluble, so it will cross the blood-brain barrier. With that being said, when you look at the dosages here, um, you want to use it before bedtime. Um, however, I don't recommend melatonin for everybody. Right? It's actually a hormone, so I, it's one of the last things I actually recommend for sleep because you have to understand what the underlying mechanism for sleep issues are. So when we look at it, you have to think about sleep hygiene. Are we doing all the necessary things, right? Are we turning off the lights? Are we sleeping in a dark room? Are we looking at our phone? Uh, sleep hygiene is very important. Blood sugar. High blood sugar, low blood sugar, all affects sleep. So you have to make sure you're not hypoglycemic, insulin resistant, diabetic, Right? These things will impact sleep overall. Sleep apnea, um, that needs to be med medically tested. You need a sleep study. I like to use actually magnesium for sleep. I have a whole video on magnesium, so you can go ahead and watch that. But in terms of actually helping the sleep cycle, I like to use magnesium over melatonin in the beginning. So you can use magnesium uh, maybe one or two hours before bed. And the reason magnesium works so well is it helps to calm things down, right? It also helps to produce GABA or inhibitory neuro, uh, neurotransmitter. So it's a very important nutrient for your sleep cycle. Now, some of the adverse effects of taking melatonin could be dizziness, headache, nausea, hypothermia, meaning low body temperature, as we talked about uh, how it regulates body temperature, agitation, fatigue, fatigue in the sense that you take too much melatonin and 
you don't you feel groggy till like noon because the melatonin is not fully out of our system. So we have mood swings, we have heart palpitations, and so forth. So there's a, there are a lot of different uh, side effects to this. However, in general, it's pretty safe. I would recommend not using high doses of melatonin and also taking it for a short period of time to regulate sleep cycles rather than use it as a crutch to sleep uh, for a long period of time. Why? Because it down regulates your receptor sites. What that means is that this loop right in here, right, how melatonin feeds back and forth, your receptors become resistant to it with any hormones, right? When you're, when you're provided exogenous or from the outside hormones to our body, your receptors will downregulate because there's a lot of it. And two, your body will stop producing that hormone or produce much less of that hormone. So you're interrupting this hormone pathway by taking exogenous hormones. So in my practice, we tend to use hormones last fix other underlying mechanisms first, right? And use things like magnesium and sleep hygiene and, and exercise uh, at proper levels to help patients fall asleep rather than use melatonin first. However, melatonin can be quite beneficial for those patients who have uh, tr troubles after doing everything they're supposed to be doing. So it's very important to do that. So I just wanna step away so you can take a look at this uh, little diagram. It's a great little diagram. I got this diagram from actually uh, the Ninja Nerds, and uh, they have great explanation how, about how physiology works. And this little diagram comes from them, so I want to give them uh, credit for that. So my name is Dr. Jin Sung, where clinical excellence meets excellent results, and we'll see you guys next week on the healthy side. Have an awesome day.